Hello, my name is Alana Lenton and I'm an Associate Professor in Cultural and Social Analysis and today I want to be talking about everyday multiculturalism. What is the link between multiculturalism, which we often think of an, as an ideology, and the everyday? And what are the potential issues and problems associated with multiculturalism? This is the overview for the lecture and the topics that I would like to discuss with you. Firstly, I'll be asking why multiculturalism? Why do we start to think about certain societies as being multicultural and where does the idea come from? Secondly, what have authors and activists had to say about multiculturalism? What are the various critiques of multiculturalism that exist in the literature. Thirdly, I'll be challenging some of the ideas that are quite prevalent in Australian society and political discourse about the harmonious nature of multiculturalism. In Australia, multiculturalism is most frequently symbolized by the idea of Harmony Day, which everybody who's ever been to a school in recent times has experienced. But what does it mean to speak about multiculturalism in the same breath as harmony? Or as Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull says, as success when he talks about Australia as a successful multicultural nation. I'd then like to think about some ideas about lived multiculture and what might be the difference between multiculturalism as a political idea or ideology or and and the everydayness of multiculturalism how literally do we live together in neighborhoods with people who are of different cultural origins i'll then be thinking about the ways in which multiculturalism have been problematized by various politicians and thinkers and commentators it's become rather prevalent to talk about multiculturalism as a failure or perhaps as being in crisis. What does this mean? Do we think multiculturalism is in, is in crisis? And if so, why? We'll then be thinking about the relationship between ideas of multiculturalism and immigration because usually when multiculturalism is problematized, it's also um, the, the fears that are um, given rise to are in terms of the culture of a nation being indelibly changed by what is often constituted as too much immigration or too much diversity, and I'll be explaining that. And lastly, I want to oppose good and bad diversity. In other words, diversity is usually something that we talk about positively, but what happens when there's a slippage into bad diversity or too much difference of the wrong kind? Okay, in order to set up the topic for today, I want to talk about the historical context for the multicultural settings in which we live in a society such as Australia, and particularly looking now at Australia before broadening the argument out to talk about other countries as well. So at the turn of the 20th century, Australia, contrary to popular uh, belief, was already becoming a multicultural society. Although the country was 98% white at this time, the discovery of gold, often referred to as the gold rush, was leading to immigration from around the world. Between 1850 and 1870, for example, 50,000 Chinese people had settled in New South Wales alone. Also, there were workers from the Pacific Islands who were being brought in to work as indentured labourers, uh, for example, on sugar plantations. So, before Federation in 1901, the possibility already existed for Australia to become an immigration nation in the way that we think of it today. But that's not quite how it went. 
Everybody knows about the history of the white Australia policy. Its real name was in fact the Immigration Restriction Act. And what you might not know is that it is one of the first pieces of legislation that was passed by the new federal parliament in 1901. So this was also meant that it was one of the first pieces of immigration legislation in the world because contrary to popular belief, nation states did not used to restrict people's immigration. Borders were much more open than they are now. There was no, such, there was no belief that one had to control immigrants at the border uh, or that you needed special permission, visas and so on in order to be able to migrate across borders. Edward Barton, the, who was the Prime Minister at the time, argued in support of the bill with the following statement. He said, the doctrine of the equality of man was never intended to apply to the equality of the Englishman and the Chinaman. So the bill, commonly known as the White Australia policy, put in place a similar policy to that in South Africa. But Australia could not be openly offensive to other members of the British Empire to which it belonged. So for example, to the Indians or indeed to the Japanese. So, in order to get around this, a dictation test was introduced to weed out those who Australia considered undesirable migrants. The test was basically impossible to pass, uh, and sometimes other languages than English were used in order to trick people up um, who couldn't pass it and therefore were denied access to Australia. The White Australia policy persisted throughout the Second World War during which Prime Minister Curtin at the time defended the policy, saying, and I quote, This country shall remain forever the home of the descendants of those people who came here in peace in order to establish in the South Seas an outpost of the British race. And in fact, the White Australia policy is only challenged after the war, when the realisation that Australia must, to coin uh, a popular term, populate or perish, takes hold. So the path to multiculturalism as an idea is opened because of this realization that if Australia is to survive as a society, economically, it must populate or perish. In other words, build up the society through immigration because there simply were not enough people living in Australia to make it economically sustainable or indeed die out as a country. So slowly the policy gets dismantled. In 1996, a Migration Act was passed, which effectively dismantled the White Australia policy. In other words, people in practice were being allowed in who were not from quote-unquote white countries. But it's actually as late as 1973, uh, just over 40 years ago, that the policy was officially dismantled. Quite soon afterwards, in 1975, you have the introduction of the Racial Discrimination Act. But of course, racial discrimination towards Aboriginal people is still rife despite this. Policies or attitudes towards Aboriginal people and migrants continues, interestingly, along two separate tracks. Multiculturalism is generally thought of to be for migrants, whereas Aboriginals, as the original inhabitants of the land, uh, are not thought of as multicultural subjects and indeed do not think of themselves as multicultural subjects because, of course, um, Australia is their land. Australia, the lucky country, plentiful land. So why multiculturalism? Early policies for the inclusion of migrants in society emphasized assimilation and integration. In other words, migrants who came to Australia and elsewhere were encouraged to forget their cultural background, traditions, customs, languages, and so on, and to become full members of the nation. So, for example, people who came from other countries were encouraged not to speak to their children in their own languages. And very often children from, for example, Greek families or Italian families were punished at school 
if they were heard speaking their own language. One of the symbols that's used to describe immigration is the US idea of the melting pot, which is often described as a sort of a big pot of soup in which people from different countries around the world are popped in and mixed around and all emerge American. According to Floya Anthias and Nira Yuval Davis, multiculturalism first emerges in the late 1960s, actually in Canada, based on the realization Firstly, that it is unrealistic to expect people to forget everything about their past. And secondly, that even if they wanted to, very often discrimination from the members of the majority of society, so for example in Australia, white Anglo-Celtic people, means that in practice it's very difficult to assimilate. You never really emerge fully Australian, uh, despite uh, every will in the world. Immigrants are never considered Australian enough and this often persists over generations and is very much a feature of contemporary Islamophobia where you see a constant questioning of whether Muslims have allegiance to Australia. And we'll be talking about this in next week's lecture on racism. So multiculturalism originates as a strategy for resisting disadvantage and creating equality. Multiculturalism, as Anthea and Yuval Davis say, is based on the realization, therefore, that the melting pot doesn't melt and that ethnic and racial divisions get reproduced from generation to generation. In Australia, multiculturalism was originally developed uh, which had been originally developed in Canada, was sort of taken on board in response to the increasing demands of well-organized groups of people from migrant backgrounds, particularly in the 1970s, Italians and Greeks. And what they wanted was to be equally recognized in the Anglo-dominated landscape of Australia and to have their cultures and traditions respected. Multiculturalism, as opposed to the melting pot metaphor of assimilation, remember I spoke about a large soup into which people are popped and mixed up, multiculturalism is often compared to a salad where every ingredient is distinct, in case you are wondering why the slide shows a picture of a fruit salad. You know, a salad is a dish which we eat in its entirety, but we can taste all of the different elements and importantly, see all of the different elements, which is why it's often been compared uh, metaphorically to multiculturalism. People have also spoken about a mosaic or a picture that's built up out of thousands of little stones in which each stone has its own logic, but when put together makes an entire picture. So under multiculturalism, cultural pluralism or cultural diversity or difference is seen as being integral to social equality. In 1973, the immigration minister, Al Grasby, said, and I quote, my concept of a society able to sustain growth and change without disintegration is a society based on equality for all. So the state policy of multiculturalism involves working to support the preservation of minority cultures by, for example, giving funding to the initiatives of community groups or through promoting knowledge of non-dominant cultures in education, in broadcasting and so on. So, for example, SBS, with which we're all familiar, emerges out of this early multiculturalism where it's recognized that, you know, public representations of society need to reflect the cultural diversity of the people actually living in society. Now, it's interesting to look at the official Australian multicultural policy. If you look at the latest version from 2011, it's the following is written, and I quote, the Australian government is unwavering in its commitment to a multicultural Australia. Australia's multicultural composition is at the heart of our national identity and is intrinsic to our history and character. In that sense, it is quite unique in comparison to all other countries. 
The emphasis of the policy is on shared values, which are seen as Australian values, most importantly fairness and respect for cultural difference and the permission to practice diversity without discrimination. Now, as I mentioned in my outline at the beginning, multicultural policy has been critiqued by many people since it was introduced in Canada, the US, the UK and Australia from the 1970s on. And one of the most important critiques is that multiculturalism in, is based on what is called a reified or an essentialist view of culture. In other words, each cultural group is, under multiculturalism, seen as being internally homogeneous. So that vision doesn't allow for variation within these groups or the fact that there are always people with different interests, needs and desires within any group that we identify as a cultural group. So, just as an example, just because you happen to be Lebanese, it doesn't mean that you will necessarily share much in common with someone else of the same origin. Not just the fact that there are differences along religious lines, as most of us are aware, but there might be differences in terms of class, in terms of sexuality, level of education, and just personal interest, and so on. The argument from the critics is that top-down visions of a multicultural society don't allow for this level of internal variation. At the same time, and this is the important part, the dominant cultural group is considered to be neutral, or if you like, the standard against which we judge all other minority groups. So in Australia, Anglos don't tend to be seen as just another cultural group among others. Interestingly, we tend to refer to them as Aussies which is interesting when we consider that other people who are not white also are nominally Aussies because they have Australian citizenship. Anglo culture is tend to be seen as the standard or the neutral norm and everyone else is expected to fit around it. Arguably then, multicultural policy doesn't do that much to encourage the majority culture to transform itself. Rather, the dominant culture can remain untouched by multiculturalism in any deep sense, except perhaps through things like the availability of more different types of food, uh, styles, music, and so on. So multiculturalism for those in the dominant cultural group might be a mere issue of lifestyle, whereas for minority groups, it is often the frame through which they are viewed and expected to conform to this culturalist vision of their lives. What do we mean by this? By focusing on culture, multiculturalism might ignore the other aspects that are important for individuals, especially those who have been traditionally disadvantaged, such as migrants in spheres such as jobs, housing, education, health, and so on. What tends to have happened is that while emphasizing the importance of cultural recognition, these other important societal, political and economic dimensions of how societies are organized tend to go ignored. As Pointing and Mason show, the emphasis on this cultural view of minority groups often led to these groups being stereotyped in ways that were quite counterproductive to what multiculturalism wanted to achieve. If you remember the quote from the Minister for Immigration in the 1970s, Al Grasby, he wanted to achieve greater social equality. So the complexity of culture also, in these quite um, broad brushstroke multicultural terms, was reduced to things like exotic food and national dress, music and dance. The focus on minority culture in the public sphere could also cause resentment among those of the dominant culture who felt left out of multicultural festivities because they didn't have a particular culture to perform. Nevertheless, at least according to Pointing and Mason, 
multicultural policies were successful in easing intercommunal tensions in Australia throughout the 1970s and 1980s. And they pointed out that until the Cronulla riots of 2005, there were no real race riots of the type that were quite common in places like the US, Britain, or France, for example. But what is multiculturalism really? David Goldberg notes that it is important to, st to distinguish between two types of multiculturalism. He calls multicultural policies, so things that the government at either the state, the federal, or the local level put into place, we can call those prescriptive. In other words, they prescribe a solution to a societal problem, much like if you have an illness and you go to the doctor and he gives you a prescription, it's supposed to solve the problem. But often when we think about what multiculturalism means, we are actually being descriptive. In other words, what we're doing is just describing our lived reality. What we see on the streets when we walk around, the kinds of interaction we have with people, and the fact that people come from different backgrounds and all live together. This is what David Goldberg calls descriptive multiculturalism. Now, interestingly, when multiculturalism is criticized, as, for example, the current treasurer, Scott Morrison, did during a speech uh, that he gave on Australia Day in 2013, the problem is never really the prescriptive policies because they remain quite vague um, and, you know, generally something that everybody can get behind. What people actually criticized and what was quite evident in that particular speech was the problems that were pointed out were associated with this everyday reality of living together in what some people have described as a super diverse society. But before we look at everyday multiculturalism, let's look at the critique of official state multiculturalism, or what Goldberg has called prescriptive multiculturalism. The 21st of March is Harmony Day in Australia, and it's interesting that that day was chosen because it's actually the United Nations International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which says a lot about the official attitude of Australia to anti-racism. It seems to be framed through a vision of harmonious multiculturalism. Official state multiculturalism in Australia, or Harmony Day, tells a story about the Australian nation, which might not always be borne out in reality. In that story, the national we is constructed as diverse, there are myriad statements about Australia as one of the most diverse societies in the world. And as I said before, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull has spoken about Australia as a successful multicultural society. So Australian multiculturalism is officially celebrated not only as a desire, so the idea that we need policy to bring it about, but as something that is already reality. But in fact, John Stratton might be more correct when he talks about Australia as having what he calls a white core and an ethnically diverse periphery or margins. It's almost impossible for people from non-white backgrounds, he says, to penetrate high levels of government, the media, academia, the law, business, and so on. Ghassan Hajj has contra contrasted official multicultural discourse with what he calls the multicultural real. He says Australia is amazingly diverse, but this largely remains hidden from view where it counts, in other words, where there is power, and remains, in his view, very superficial. As we saw, multiculturalism tends to see ethnic groups as internally diverse. Initiatives such as Harmony Day celebrate diversity at a superficial level. Food, traditional dress, music, 
are all the kinds of things that we would see at a typical Harmony Day celebration. But if the purpose of multicultural policy is in fact, as I've said before, to bring about greater social equality, we might want to ask whether focusing on these more palatable aspects of cultural diversity is enough. In essence, official multiculturalism, as both Hodge and Stratton have said, leaves the majority of Australians and Anglo-Celtic identity unchanged while merely tolerating those on what are thought of as the ethnic fringes. So we might want to ask the following, I would suggest, important questions. Who here is doing the tolerating? What does it mean to tolerate something or somebody? Is merely putting up with something enough to make a lasting change? As Phillips argues, and I quote, multiculturalism is presented as a way of living with difference, where difference stands opposed to the lived experience of the majority. So the argument is that Australia as a whole does not become diverse. If we belong to an ethnic majority, we are not called upon to change in order to fit in with the multicultural reality. While on the other hand, so-called minorities are constantly called upon to perform their difference for, people like Hodge argues, the spectatorship of the white majority who are in turn asked to tolerate them. This leads, arguably, to an imbalance of power and to the question, when are Australians of non-white or non-Anglo backgrounds going to be thought of as merely Aussie? What needs to change in order for that to happen? Overall, official multiculturalism of the Australian state can be looked at as a technique for managing and perhaps even for containing diversity. It allows for difference to be recognized, but only on the terms set out by the state and the dominant cultural group. I'm going to illustrate this in greater detail when at the end I come to talk about the difference between what I call good and bad diversity. Now, as mentioned, when multiculturalism is critiqued, the problem is less with official state multiculturalism of the Harmony Day variety, or if you like, with the words of the official multicultural policy, and more with the multicultural reality or the multicultural real that Ghassan Hajj speaks about. The fact is that in today's Australia, most of us live with multiculturalism every day, especially in Western Sydney. The sociologist Amanda Wise, who works at Macquarie University, has looked at multicultural living at the micro level of the everyday. She calls this multiculturalism from below, as a way of giving meaning and enriching the superficial descriptions of diversity that can be found in the official policies and Harmony Day statements. Understanding this will help us understand better why ordinary Australians from diverse backgrounds rub along together, or indeed, if they do not, why they don't. Wise has come up with a concept which sounds like a bit of a mouthful. She calls it quotidian transversality, quotidian meaning daily. Breaking it down, it's, she's basically interested in the question of how do individuals in ethnically diverse suburbs and neighbourhoods interact in a way that ensures that everybody gets along? And what might disrupt this? In other words, what external factors, such as racism or discrimination, for example, disturb this living together in ethnically diverse locations? According to Wise, there are a number of factors which are important for living together in any society. She talks about reciprocity and social networks, ways of talking among neighbours, for example. But what is it that complexifies these aspects of social life or of living together in an ethnically diverse area? According to Wise, the idea of transversality is about 
interchange, which she says is not just about exchange, which is direct. In other words, if I give you something and you give me something back, it's the end of the story. But she argues that interchange is about actually trying to put yourself in another person's shoes so that we can empathize with them and as a consequence shift our perspective about what their lives are all about. Wise's research showed the importance of people who she called transversal enablers or individuals who she says do the work of creating these connections between people from different cultural backgrounds in the everyday. So for example, she explored the importance of gift giving between neighbors from diverse cultural origins. And she wrote, for example, about the suburb of Ashfield in which neighbors who give each other fruit and vegetables um, is quite a common practice. And she says that this is a form of place sharing. It's not about the gift itself, but about what she calls the facilitation of neighborly and kin relations. This is the kind of multiculturalism from below that she argues is very important in creating um, environments of lived multiculture. Now, whereas Amanda Wise is quite um, optimistic about multiculturalism, Ghassan Haj, we've seen before, is quite more pessimistic about the transformative capacities of daily multiculturalism than she is. And he says that what he calls a cosmo multiculturalism is less about migrants building a home in Australia, where they feel that they truly belong, and more about an experience of white, middle-class, cosmopolitan consumption. This video is of the Para Masala uh, event, which is held in Parramatta every year, in which Indian culture uh, has a passage. Really Ghassan Haj argues that in events such as these, and I brought my individual generally, designs to the Paramount multiculturalism has been so good for the Australian diet. Great combination between we experience India multiculturalism in culturally diverse areas, he says, in the same way that we experience, experience tourism when we go on holiday. In other words, it remains external. This is specially is something designed for, for our pleasure, but which does not have to alter us in a fundamental way. Welcome. Focusing on the experience of eating in so called ethnic restaurants, Hodge says that they are constructed with the desires of Anglo Australians in mind rather than being served. We're from Wollongong and we've come to Paramasala to see the cultural performances and Hodge calls this multiculturalism without life. And I'm getting a Mehendi tattoo because I'm very interested in the Indian culture and their head tattoos and I'm very excited that I can do it in Australia. No, it's happiness, it's rights, it's lights. It's, it's all the good feeling. It brings us all together. Now, as I mentioned before, former um, immigration minister, current treasurer, Scott Morrison, gave a speech on Australia Day in 2013. And in it, he gave his vision of a post-multicultural Australia, which, as he put it, would restore some balance by ensuring that we are more focused on what we have in common rather than how different we all are. This echoes the consensus view of many mainstream politicians and commentators, most prevalently in Europe, that multiculturalism has been a failure. It hasn't led to bringing people closer together, but rather to creating less social cohesion and less unity in society. However, Morrison's view, and those of other anti-multiculturalists, is not that there is something within the idea of multiculturalism itself that is at fault, so it's not a critique of multiculturalism of the kind that I exposed at the beginning as being problematic because it essentialized minorities or fails to question the dominance of the majority. Rather, the problem, quite bluntly, is with minorities themselves. 
Multiculturalism, from the perspective of this critique, is often thought of as a gift which is given to ethnic minorities by the white elite. It was supposed to be, at the time that it was invented, a sweetener, if you like, that will ensure the containment of inter-ethnic relations, in other words, to keep everybody happy. But as we know, tensions still exist because we haven't achieved equality between members of different groups in Australia or indeed anywhere else. Now, the problem is that the blame is put onto minorities for choosing not to belong or choosing not to integrate. Morrison talks about, and I quote, self-imposed cultural withdrawal and disaffection with multiculturalism in areas uh, of what he called high ethnic concentration. So he advocates a return to what he calls the supremacy of Australian values. In other words, less care should be given to recognize cultural diversity and more emphasis should be placed on Anglo-Australian history and cultural norms. This was very much the idea between former Prime Minister Tony Abbott's Team Australia. So the idea that there is a slippery slope between not being seen to fully espouse Australian values, so for example, moral panic about students not wishing to sing the national anthem in school, and these types of things, and that these types of evidences of a failure to belong culturally pose a risk to the safety of Australian society. So there's a link made between cultural practice and the security of the nation. And much of this is arguably a barely veiled form of Islamophobia in the current day. One of the major fears of those who oppose multiculturalism is that being too open towards cultural diversity will lead to our cities becoming segregated into ghettos, a language imported from the United States. In Australia, it's been pointed out that while we may have suburbs where large members of particular ethnic groups live, so for example, Lakemba or Cabramatta, we cannot speak of ghettos. Now, a ghetto, it's important to recognize, is a place not where people choose to live, in the sense that we often think about it today, but actually a place where certain groups were forced to live. For example, uh, Jews who were forced by Nazis to live in certain closed-off areas of the city. However, the fear of what is called self-segregation, or minorities who, it is suggested, choose not to live among the majority, underpins the idea that multiculturalism has been bad for the unity of the country as a whole. Critics of this idea point out that it is usually when ethnic minority groups move into a neighbourhood that whites tend to leave. This even has a name, it's called white flight. Wealthier white people, in fact, statistically, tend to be more segregated than poor people or non-white people and immigrants, who, in fact, have less of a choice about where they can live, which is often motivated by where is affordable for them. In the UK, for example, since 2005, there has been a lot of moral panic about the idea that society, to use a coined phrase, is sleepwalking to segregation. In response, the book that you can see on the slide by two statisticians, Nissa Finney and Ludi Simpson, was published. It's called Sleepwalking to Segregation, Challenging Myths About Race and Migration. And because they are statisticians, they use statistics to overturn some of the common myths about multiculturalism and its impact on society. One of the most pressing fears that they talk about in the book is that certain cities in the UK will, in the near future, become minority white. Nissa Finney explains that, in fact, the cities with the highest numbers of ethnic minority groups are also the most diverse and the best integrated. So we should ask why the fact that some cities in Britain and maybe some areas of Australian cities will no longer be uh, majority white matters? Why do we make a link between Britishness or Australianness and race? 
even if Lebanese, Vietnamese, Greeks, Italians, Anglos and Pacific Islanders were to make up the demographics of a particular suburb in even numbers, rather than whites dominating, why are we worried that this would change the Australian nature of the area, given that everybody living there is either a citizen or has temporary or permanent residence, in other words, the legitimate right to live there? there are, these are clues to the issue, uh, which we'll discuss in greater detail when we look, look at the experience of racism in the everyday, which of course cannot be taken out of the equation when discussing contemporary fears about multiculturalism. In 2011, I published a book with my friend and colleague Gavin Titley called The Crises of Multiculturalism, Racism in a Neoliberal Age. And in that book, we argued that the objection to multiculturalism might just be another way of expressing racism. In other words, it's not culture that we have a problem with in general, but too much culture of the wrong kind. Now, generally, when we talk about diversity, we think about it as something that everybody can share in. Indeed, everyone wants to be seen as diverse in the sense of being unique or standing out from the crowd. We might say, what's your unique selling point, your USP? Multicultural policies catering uniquely for minority ethnic groups are therefore increasingly being replaced by a more mainstream focus on difference in general, precisely because we all thought of we all want to be thought of as unique and different in some kind of sense, standing out from the crowd. But, and this is the important part, not all difference, not all diversity is thought of as good. There is always a kind of a tipping point, the point at which diversity becomes too much or excessive and society tips over from good diversity into so-called bad diversity. While good diversity is said to add value to society without threatening to replace the status quo, so keeping the majority culture intact, bad diversity is portrayed as a threat to so-called social cohesion. For example, much of the moral panic about bad diversity today concentrates on Muslims in the post 9-11 era. Take, for example, uh, when we talk about uh, winter 2016, the furor in France about women wishing to go to the beach wearing a burkini and the suggestion that this should be banned in certain areas, uh, in certain beach towns, that there's too much, there's too much visible difference on the beaches of France is the argument. Islam and Muslims are seen, therefore, as incompatible with Western ways of life. The fear that has always accompanied multiculturalism is that non-white, non-Christians, today Muslims in particular, will have more allegiance to their religion or country of origin than to the country to which they have migrated. Examples here in Australia include statements made by somebody like Jackie Lambie or Pauline Hansen about the burqa, um, about uh, halal certification and the growth of a campaign indeed in Australia against halal certification on ordinary food products. However, we might argue in response that if multiculturalism was established to ensure greater equality between groups from different backgrounds, then the fact that tensions exist in contemporary multicultural societies such as Australia may have less to do with cultural difference itself, as Nissa Finney and Amanda Wise both show, because they say that the more diverse the area, the greater integration in fact there is in that area, and that the problems associated with multiculturalism might have more to do with social, economic and political inequality, both within societies such as Australia or in particular neighbourhoods, but also on a global scale and it's to those issues that we'll be turning next week when we discuss the connection between racism and the everyday.